Greetings, and welcome to Alpha Gambits, Sketchy U's exclusive chess and overachievement club. Here you can decide between a Catalan opening, a French defense, or Norwegian nuclear meltdown. Okay, maybe I'm not exactly a grandmaster, but an Alpha Gambit meeting is the perfect place to talk about reactions that occur at the carbon next door to a carbonyl group, the so-called Alpha Carbon. Shall we? See this shy guy peeking around the door? That's Al. And as usual, Al is here, hiding, to remind you of aldehydes. The close cousin of an aldehyde is a ketone, which is why there's a C double bond O key in the door. Al and the key are here because the reactions we'll be talking about in this sketch occur alpha to the carbonyls in aldehydes or ketones. That means we'll be looking at the carbons one bond away from the carbon-oxygen double bond. Let's start with the most important feature of the alpha position of an aldehyde or ketone. It's acidity. This chess club member is sporting an exclusive alpha gambits necklace while sipping a lemonade to remind you that the hydrogen atoms bonded to alpha carbons are way more acidic than typical carbon-bound hydrogens. We call these hydrogens alpha hydrogens, and they get their acidity from the fact that removing one of them results in formation of an oxygen anion called an enolate, which you can remember by the sign next to the door letting you know that tonight's chess club will end late. Oh, uh, hold on. You deprotonate a carbon and end up with an oxygen anion? Well, that's the magic of resonance. The most important resonance structure of an enolate puts the negative formal charge on oxygen instead of carbon, which you can remember with this O-shaped frowny face. By deprotonating and reprotonating an aldehyde or ketone that has alpha hydrogens, the molecule can be converted into an alternate form, called an enol, which has a carbon-carbon double bond and an OH group. This occurs through a process called tautomerization, which you can remember by this tense taut fella. And he's moving his plus sign hat from the alpha necklace C hook to the O knob on the carbonyl coat rack to symbolize that tautomerization occurs when the alpha hydrogen migrates up to the carbonyl oxygen. So, what can we do with the deprotonated alpha carbons of enols and enolates? Well, we've got a new kid t-shirt here to remind you that these molecules are nucleophilic at the alpha position, which means they can form new bonds with all different kinds of electrophiles. These nucleophiles can even bond to carbon atoms to form a new carbon-carbon bond, which you can remember by the fact that the new kid T's C hanger is bonded to the rack's C knob. The Freshies finally made it through the Gambit's initiation process, and they gotta leave those shirts behind. And I hear the bloodshed was minimal this year. Ah, I'm moving right along. There is another important ramification of tautomerization that you'll need to keep in mind. Racemization. That's right, racemization is a ramification of tautomerization. <clears throat> Regardless, we've placed a mirror here in the gift shop area to remind you that racemization creates enantiomers stereoisomers that are mirror images of the original molecules. When the alpha hydrogen of a carbonyl gets shuttled back and forth to oxygen during tautomerization, it might come back to the alpha carbon on the opposite face of a molecule, leading to a mix of S and R chiral centers, hence racemization with tautomerization. Tautomerization is not just for aldehydes and ketones, though. Imines can do it at their alpha carbons, too. That playlist of brain jams repeatedly shuffling the songs I Mine and Public Enamine represents that tautomerization of an imine creates an enamine. Well, what's going on here? These study buds are here to remind you of kinetic and thermodynamic enolates. The fast moving hammock swinger symbolizes a kinetic enolate. This is an enolate that's formed rapidly, particularly if a bulky base is used in the reaction. She's so wobbly because kinetic enolates are less stable than their cousins, thermodynamic enolates. Thermodynamic enolates are represented by this fella, who's stable on the ground as he relaxes by the thermal heater. Kinetic enolates are most often formed when deprotonation is performed at low temperature. Conversely, thermodynamic enolates are formed when reactions happen at higher temperatures. 
That's why our kinetic chess player is in a cool mesh hammock, while our thermodynamic enolate friend is in front of a heater. Oh, yes! This is what we came to see. Live chess action. Let's take a look at the first two gaming tables to talk about aldol condensations, a common reaction you'll see at the alpha carbon. The aldol condensation happens in two steps. First is an addition reaction, which we'll cover at table one. Aldol condensations can occur with either aldehydes or ketones, but aldehydes are the most common substrates. That's why we've named both of these chess players Al. During the addition step of an aldol reaction, the alpha carbon on one reactant bonds to the carbonyl carbon of the other reactant. These players' straight arms coming together should remind you of the shape of the intermediate formed during this process, which is called a beta-hydroxyaldehyde. In a beta-hydroxyaldehyde, the carbon that acted as the electrophile loses its double bond to oxygen and instead has an attached alcohol group, which we've symbolized with this refreshing Coe's light this player is sipping on. Now, at table two, the match is so close, it's turned sweat-inducing. And all that water our players are losing symbolizes the water that's lost in the second step of an aldol condensation, dehydration. The aldol dehydration step forms a new carbon-carbon double bond at the alpha carbon, which is symbolized by this player's double arms on the table, which might be an unfair advantage because chess is a collision sport. I have to admit, I really don't understand this game. In fact, all this confusing chess is making me cross like a crossed aldol reaction. Let's check out the last table to see how one of those works. Hopefully this is in the beginner's area. First, we can see that our two players have crossed arms for the crossed aldol. Makes sense. Uh, next, notice that unlike the players at the other tables, these two chess stars are wearing differently colored outfits. That's to let you know that the crossed aldol occurs between two different aldehydes or ketones, or even one of each. Finally, check out the hat the left player is wearing. He's the only one wearing a proton hat, because it's important in a crossed aldol reaction to have only one reactant with an enolizable proton at the alpha position. If both reactants were to have a proton that's easy to move around, multiple reactions could occur, and you might end up with a mess of different products. So now we've got one last reaction in the aldol family to learn, the retroaldol. That's right, retro meaning roughly go back in time, just like this chess star is trying to do as she embraces her mom's 70s wardrobe. In a retroaldol reaction, a molecule that looks like the product of a regular aldol addition goes backwards in time, reverting back to the starting materials that could have formed it. An enolate acts as a leaving group from a beta hydroxycarbonyl, just like this gal is leaving to catch her next meeting with the disco club. Anyways, when the enolate leaves, the bond between the alpha and beta carbons will break, which we've symbolized with the beta sunglasses our retro star is tossing behind her, separating them from her alpha necklace. Okay, I'm jumping in her boat. I am not sticking around for this meeting to end late. So let's recap enolates and alpha carbon reactions. Hydrogens at the alpha position, which is next door to the CO double bond in aldehydes and ketones, are relatively acidic. Removal of one of these hydrogens gives an enolate, which is an oxygen anion formed by carbon deprotonation. Enols and enolates can be interconverted with aldehydes and ketones by a proton shuttling process called tautomerization. Once enolates form, their carbons can act nucleophilic, allowing for formation of new carbon-carbon bonds. The tautomerization process can also scramble any chiral centers that are alpha to carbonyls, resulting in racemization. It's also useful to note that imines and enamines can also undergo tautomerization. Deprotonation at alpha carbons can sometimes lead to two different kinds of enolates being formed. Kinetic enolates, which are unstable but form rapidly at low temperatures, or thermodynamic enolates, which are more stable but formed more slowly and require higher temperatures. Next, there's the two-step aldol condensation reaction, which occurs between two aldehydes or ketones. The first step of the aldol reaction forms a beta-hydroxyaldehyde by carbon-carbon bond formation. And the second step of the aldol dehydrates that molecule to give a new carbon-carbon double bond. In a crossed aldol, two different aldehydes or ketones are mixed. 
This works out just fine, as long as only one of these molecules has an enolizable alpha hydrogen. And finally, the retroaldol reaction undoes all the work done by the aldol reaction. It breaks a carbon-carbon bond between an alpha and a beta carbon, creating an enolate leaving group. <sighs> I don't know about you, but my rook and king have swapped places, and I'd much rather boogie down to the disco club. Honestly, only because they have free pizza. But don't tell Groove Master Gary. I'm going to keep up my appearances. These bell-bottoms were not cheap.